Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to see how many people turn up at 7 o'clock on a, a middle of the week to listen to Failure to Launch about interest rates. So as hopefully you know, when I talk about Failure to Launch, I am not here to talk about the 2006 movie <laughs> called A Failure to Launch. Um, this is a movie, if you have not seen it, which you probably have not, about um, a 30-something young man, played by Matt McConaughey, who did not want to launch from his parents' home. So his parents hired Sarah Jessica Parker to basically get him to leave their parents' home so they could have their home back. So I will not be talking about that tonight. I am going to leave it up for a minute just in case someone walks by to make it look like we're talking about something interesting and maybe we'll get a few more people. Um, but what I am here to talk about is why it has been so hard to launch interest rates off near zero or emergency levels in so many countries around the world since a crisis that happened nine years ago. Why is so much monetary stimulus believed to be needed around the world, even though global economic growth has been above 3% for seven years? Inflation is expected to pick up to over 3.5% in the world by the end of this year. Um, why are central banks so reticent to raise interest rates around the world, despite the fact that we all know keeping interest rates so low for so long does present risks over time? It presents ri risks of fostering financial market bubbles, unsustainable borrowing, supporting an inefficient allocation of resources, and creating challenges for pension funds, savers, and banks. So why has it been so hard to raise interest rates? So some of you are probably sitting there thinking, oh, that's not true. Some countries have done it. Take, for example, the US. And yes, the US is the one country that has successfully launched in the sense of getting interest rates up and keeping them up and doing a series of interest rate increases. This is, um, shows what's happened in the US. The light blue is the main policy rate in the US. They have raised interest rates four times starting at the end of 2015. So this is what I would call a successful launch, at least recently. But it's also important to put this, this is the success story. Let's put this in a historic context. Traditionally, in the US, hiking cycles involved eight increases in interest rates, averaging two percentage points in total over 13 months. Look at how long this has gone on, and we haven't even gone half that distance. They've only raised it one percentage point so far, starting at the end of 2015. Now, here's another way to put it even more in perspective. So I'm going to take the same increase in interest rates in the US that looks like the big success on this graph, and let's put it in a little bit longer historic perspective. Same blue line, now at the bottom right. Clearly not a huge increase in interest rates. Um, interest rates are now about 1 to 1.25 um, basis points, um, but much, much, much lower than the 5 plus, 5 and a quarter um, percent that it was at pre-crisis. And the fact the US has gotten interest rates up to 1 to 1.25 um, is ignoring the fact that this is coincided with an increase in the Fed's balance sheet of $3.4 trillion of asset purchases that they have not yet even started to unwind. So this is the success. This is the best case we've got out there of a country able to raise interest rates a bit. Still clearly a substantial amount of stimulus in place. Um, so that's, again, the one country that has had some success launching interest rates above zero. So as a background for this project, I put together a list of all the advanced economies to see if there are any more examples of countries that have been able to raise rates. And I focused on any advanced economy that focuses on inflation as one of their primary targets. So I ignored those that basically fixed their exchange rate. US is the only one, again, that has managed to raise its policy rate since 2011 and maintain that increase. There are nine countries that have tried, nine liftoffs, and they've all been aborted. All of those countries did get rates up, and then they were forced to reverse that rate increase, and seven of those nine countries now have rates lower than where they started. And here's a few examples of just a few of those countries. Um, Australia is pretty typical on the top left cor uh, corner. There was the second country in the advanced economies to raise interest rates post-crisis. They got rates up a bit. You can see the little blue in the middle. And then they lowered rates, lowered, 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 and have ended up with rates even lower than when they started to try to lift them. Um, Sweden's another example. Country tried to raise rates, and have <laughs> been down, 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 and now they're at negative rates. So a number of countries have tried to lift off rates, but it's been aborted. And then there's another set of countries, which I call the grounded countries, the countries that never even got a single interest rate increase off. 
And here's just a few of those countries. It's basically the rest of the countries out there. Shows the diversity of their experiences from the Czech Republic to Japan to Switzerland to the example close to home, the United Kingdom. Um, United Kingdom has not managed to raise interest rates once since the crisis. And this is something that has been quite a surprise to me. It's been quite a personal experience going through this. Almost exactly three years ago, I started on the MPC. And before I joined the MPC, the Bank of England had already started to signal they were likely to start raising interest rates soon. So I expected I would join in July of 2014, and pretty soon after that, we'd be starting to hike interest rates, and by now we would have launched a cycle of interest rate increases and be well on our way. Instead, if you look at that graph, we never raised rates once, and instead of seeing rates quite a bit higher, rates are lower than when I started. Um, granted, the reason that they're lower is because last August, after the Brexit vote, there was a majority decision to lower interest rates and also do a substantial stimulus in terms of 70 billion sterling of additional asset purchases of corporate government bonds. So this is a substantial easing that has happened over my term um, when you include the asset purchases. Very different, again, than the increase in interest rates I expected. And that raises a number of questions. Um, if you look at growth, the black line there, growth has been pretty decent, pretty solid over my time on the MPC. Average GDP growth over the three years I've been there has been roughly 2.3%. That's probably above trend, pretty solid growth. That does not look like an economy that is so weak it needs a lot of stimulus. Um, you might argue that the reason that interest rates were lowered and there was this big stimulus done in August was because the economy was expected to deteriorate sharply after the Brexit vote, when there was an increase in uncertainty and a big deterioration in some of the indicators of sentiment and confidence. But then after that stimulus package was announced last August, the economy didn't deteriorate nearly to the degree we expected. Instead, actually, the economy strengthened. So going into the second half of last year, um, the growth actually picked up, unemployment fell. So that if you look at the economy today, relative to last August when rates were lowered and the stimulus was announced, GDP is now 1% higher um, than we had forecast last August to justify all the stimulus taken on. Uh, unemployment is 0.5 percentage points lower than we expected last August. Unemployment has fallen to a 40-year low instead of getting worse, as expected last August. So I think it does raise some questions of why interest rates haven't been raised at all before the Brexit vote, and then also why the stimulus package that was undertaken based on the expectation of a potential sharp deterioration hasn't been reversed now that the economy hasn't deteriorated nearly as much. So that raises the key question that I'm going to focus on today, and that is why it has been so hard to raise interest rates around the world from the emergency levels adopted during the crisis. I'm going to focus on my experience in the UK, partly because that's something I've been so closely involved in. But most of the lessons I talk about today are lessons you could apply to other countries. Um, and could explain the, the difficulty for countries around the world to raise interest rates. So what I'm going to do, the game plan for the next half hour or so, is I'm going to focus on three broad sets of explanations for why rates have not gone up in so many advanced economies around the world. Um, the first set of explanations, and I'll obviously do each of these in more details, but just to give you an idea of where I'm going, first set of explanations is economic arguments. Basically, the economy has been too fragile for advanced economies to raise rates. I'll talk about headwinds, post-crisis effects, low R start, secular stagnation, and the series of unfortunate events and shocks to the world. Then second, second part of my talk, I'll talk about changes to the monetary policy process, basically ways that central banking has changed. New tools used by central bankers, expanded roles for central bankers, and increased constraints on how the monetary policy process works related to the lower bound and the sensitivity of the exchange rate. And then finally, the third part, I'll talk about um, another factor which has probably made it hard to raise rates, especially in the UK, and that's the persistence of inflation dynamics. What has driven inflation, and especially the role of the exchange rate in sterling's appreciation in keeping inflation low persistently in making it hard to raise rates. So that's what I'll talk about each of those explanations for a bit. And then at the end, what I'll do is I will conclude that basically all of those have played a role in making it hard to raise rates, including in the UK up until recently. And then for my final set of comments, I'll close by saying, OK, those can all explain why rates haven't gone up yet or didn't go up as of the beginning of the year. But what about today? 
how do each of those arguments apply to the rate decision we are making, we made last week, and that um, the MPC will continue to make over the next few months. And I'll show you how some of those factors play less weight today, especially the first one. Some will probably play, still play some role, the changes in the monetary policy process, the second, but how the third factor, which previously held rates down, has now completely gone into reverse and provides a powerful reason why we should be raising interest rates soon. So that's the game plan. I will conclude um, by saying that, and after going through those reasons, I will conclude by talking again about the monetary policy stance today and arguing that if we do not launch interest rates in the UK soon, we may be facing greater challenges uh, than the, the young 30-something who did not leave the parents' house at the start. But let me start with the economics. So what I'm going to talk about now, um, I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A, so I'm not going to go into all the details of all these arguments. If you are interested in what I talk about, I have a formal written speech that is posted on the Bank of England website. Um, so after this, if you want more details, want all the sites, want all the facts and exact numbers, I encourage you to go and read that. But tonight, given the hour and given that we want to do q and I'm going to run through a few of these quickly. And that's especially true for the first set of arguments. And that's because the first set of economic arguments of why rates have not gone up are arguments that you've largely all heard by now. At least if you read NPC statements or Bank of England statements, the economic arguments have been a key component of why many people have not supported raising interest rates until now. Um, so let me just go through those again pretty quickly, because they are important, they have played a role. But again, I don't think I have any great new ground to break here. I'll just quickly give you my thoughts on them. So the first set of arguments. After the crisis, there are some headwinds on the economy, post-crisis effects that hold back growth, and monetary policy therefore has to be low, keep interest rates very low, provide monetary stimulus to balance the headwinds and balance the post-crisis effects. So we've heard those arguments for a while, and there's a lot of different um, variants of those arguments. There are headwinds from fiscal policy. Fiscal policy was expansionary during the crisis. Now there has to be some consolidation to get debt levels down, and that holds back growth, and that's a reason to provide monetary stimulus. Um, also, there was less investment during the crisis. That holds back growth afterwards because there's less capital stock, lower productivity growth. Uh, less efficient allocation of resources during the crisis. That can hold back growth. Whole host of arguments along um, those lines, and a lot of evidence that when you have a major financial crisis, it does take years for the economy to recover, especially the financial system. So I think that there has, is something there. There are a lot of headwinds post-crisis that has held back growth. And more recently, there's some variants of that where the fact rates have been so low for so long, that also might be starting to create some additional headwinds. For example, savers for, have not been making much money as interest rates have been so low for so long. So the older generation that had counted on earning more from their savings may have earned less, which means they have less money for consumption, which in turn might be starting to slow down growth a bit. So you can make an, even extend these arguments of how headwinds and crisis effects are slowing down growth to even zero or interest rates near zero are also feeding through into that and slowing down growth. So a whole set of arguments in there that probably has some merit, although probably growing less strong as the length of time from the crisis has grown. And then a second set of arguments, economic arguments of the fragile recovery, why we couldn't raise rates, are based on our start. So our start is economists speak for the uh, equilibrium rate of interest or natural rate of interest, which I'm sure helps incredibly. <laughs> um, but anyway, what it's supposed to capture is the concept of that is that our start natural rate of interest is roughly where interest rates would be set to keep the economy growing at potential with inflation about at target, where interest rates are not providing any additional stimulus to the economy. They're neutral. Um, so basically, if so, there's been a lot of work showing that our start has probably fallen over time. This is incredibly hard to measure, a lot of arguments of how you measure it, a lot of different numbers out there. This is one of the credible estimates out there um, by some Fed economists. Um, I don't want to get into details of how you calculate it, if it's right or wrong, but I think the main point, no matter how you look at this, is it has fallen quite a bit over time. And the, the purple shows the our estimate of our start for the UK the blue for the US, whichever way you look at it, it's lower today. Now what that means is if interest rates are set at 25 basis points, where they are in the UK today, the amount of stimulus being provided is the distance from that 25 basis points to wherever this r star line is in purple. So if you go back to, say, the early 1990s, where r star was about 
you had then had a 2.75 percentage worth of stimulus being provided if rates were at 25 basis points. It's a lot of stimulus. If our start has fallen as suggested here to 1.25, then with rates at 25, you're only getting one percentage point of stimulus instead of much more. So I think there is something to that. Our start has fallen. That means rates set low aren't providing as much stimulus as in the past. But it still means we're still getting quite a bit of stimulus from the UK. Um, interest rates are still quite a bit below our start. So that means you're still supporting the economy, still supporting growth. Um, not as much as you would have in the past by saying rates are 25 basis points, but it's still providing stimulus. So I don't think that's a main reason why we haven't been able to lift rates at all. It means rates will probably not go as high as they were in the past, but again, it's not a powerful explanation for why rates haven't risen at all. So third explanation. Um, this is what the Bank of England, we like to call a series of unfortunate events. <laughs> um, there has been a lot that has happened over the three years I've been on the MPC. Um, and you don't like to, uh, I don't like to say this time is different, but again, there have been a lot going on um, that have been creating some drags on the economy and holding back inflation in many cases. And here's a graph of just a few of the things that you know, come up in MPC meetings over the last three years. Starting with the gray, which is some major global economic shocks. Right about when I started on the MPC in 2014, oil prices started to fall and fall and fall and fall again. Um, and the fact oil prices fell so much immediately started to bring down inflation in the UK. Now, on the MPC, we knew this was likely to be a temporary effect. We knew that we should look through this and not adjust rates in response, and we were comfortable with that decision. So even as headline inflation went to zero and then fell below zero briefly, we didn't think the, the effects of oil prices on headline inflation justified easing monetary policy. But at the same time, with headline inflation around zero, it's hard to make the case of why you should be rushing to raise interest rates. Um, so I think that did play some role in our thinking. Um, and then right as some of those effects started to fade, then you started to see sharp capital outflows from China, increased concerns about global financial stability, about emerging markets, and those effects on global growth, which would in turn affect the UK economy. So there were some pretty big global events over the last three years that have made us more cautious about raising interest rates. And then on top of that, the red bars capture the dates of a few elections we have had recently. Um, they, I didn't even try to highlight how much the periods around elections and before or after elections, there was increased uncertainty um, around those elections. But over my term on the MPC, we've had the Scottish referendum to stay in the UK. We've had the UK referendum to stay in the EU. We've had two general elections um, and a surprise result from the Brexit vote. I personally would not hold off adjusting rates because there's an election going on. But when you do have these big events, they do create uncertainty. And there is quite a bit of evidence that, in some cases, heightened uncertainty can mean businesses delay investment, consumers um, delay spending, and people can change their behavior. Workers may be more hesitant to switch jobs or argue for higher wages when there's potential uncertainty about what's going to happen to the economy. So these are factors that we have to think about. They have increased uncertainty. And especially for some of these events where there's a specific date, you get a result, and then there might be more certainty about how certain economic variables will, will evolve. If there's no rush to raise interest rates, you can see why some people might say, oh, I'll just wait, see what the result is, and then I'll have more information on the economy, and then I'm better informed to make an interest rate decision. So I think you put it all together. There's been a lot of unfortunate events um, that have been affecting the economy that have made it a bit harder to raise interest rates in some of these cases, especially the oil shocks and risks around the global economy. So although it is a funny name, I do put some weight on the fact of these, the series of events have on certain meetings um, you know, raised the bar to raise interest rates. So put it all together. I very quickly went through some economic arguments of why it's been hard to raise rates. I think there's some validity to all of these. These economic factors have played a role. There are headwinds. Our start has fallen, so there's less stimulus from low rates. And there have been a series of one-off events which have raised uncertainty. So I think that's part of the argument, but I don't think it's all. And um, let me show you some data that makes me think this can't explain why rates have not gone up at all. 
Might it justify why some stimulus is still needed in the UK? But it's hard to justify, again, why rates are at 25 basis points and why we have bought 70 billion additional of asset purchases. Why is so much stimulus needed? So to make the case that it's not all about economics, I'm going to again show you some data from today. This is very high level, um, very big picture, but these are some of the key variables that factor into monetary policy decisions. So I've tried to graph them using spider webs. They look more complicated than they are. Um, what I basically do on these is graph five key variables we talk about in MPC meetings, CPI inflation, core inflation, GDP growth, um, averaged over two quarters to get, avoid some of the monthly or quarterly volatility, unemployment rate, and wage growth. And then what I do is in black, I graph the historical average for each of those variables. Then in blue, I graph the most recent uh, value for each of those measured as a standard deviation from the average. And then the red is where the same variable was at the time of previous tightening cycles, when the UK raised rates in the past. And the way to, really the way to interpret these quickly, without worrying about the details, is the closer the point is to the middle, the worse the economy is. The further it is out, the better the economy is by that measure. So what you see, if you look at that quickly using that measure, the UK today, the blue, most of those, or a good part of those bars are around historical averages or above. So inflation, core inflation, headline inflation, are well above where interest rates have traditionally been tightened in the UK. Unemployment, well below, much better than traditionally when interest rates have been tightened. Not quite so strong when measured by wage growth or GDP growth. But that's the comparison you often hear made. I think there is a problem with this comparison. So if any of you read anyone making this comparison, um, here's a red flag. I think it's not right to compare these values versus historical averages. The economy has changed. Some of this is post-crisis effects. Some of this is demographics. Aging population means that the economy just can't grow as quickly, or a slower population growth means the economy just can't grow as quickly as it did in the past. So to really do these sorts of comparisons, how's the economy versus um, where it should be to raise rates, what you really should do is not look at historic averages. Instead, look at each of these variables relative to a steady state level. So basically, what is trend growth? The fastest the economy can grow without inflation taking off. What's the inflation target? What's the rate of wage growth after adjusting for productivity growth consistent with inflation around 2%? So that's what I do in this variant, which I think is a better way to think about it. Same blue, where the latest variables are for each of these today. But then the red dot is about the target, or about the number roughly consistent with growth at trend, inflation at target, 2%. And what you see here now is most of those measures, the UK is at the equilibrium or above. Um, GDP growth, even though it has slowed, is probably around where trend growth is in the UK. Probably can't grow much faster without inflation taking off. Unemployment, probably at about full employment in the UK right now. You know, some argument about exactly where that point is, but pretty close. By inflation, the UK is overstimulated. Inflation is above where it should be for steady state levels. The only measure that's not quite as strong is wage growth. Wage growth isn't quite at the level that one would expect to be tightening. But when looking at that graph, you know, smart people can have disagreements about what variable you put more weight on and how that affects your decision. But it's hard to make the case this is an economy that is so weak, we haven't been able to raise interest rates once. And we need a huge amount of stimulus. You know, if I were in that rocket ship launching off and I looked down at the UK, I'd say this looks like an economy that's probably overstimulated. You should probably need some stimulus, get wages back up, some, but you don't need a massive amount of stimulus. So bottom line, economic arguments for um, keeping rates low, I think there's something there but it's playing less of a weight today. So I think there's something more to it. And that's what I want to move to next. Are there changes in the monetary policy process that may have made it hard to raise rates? Something on, in addition to economic arguments. So there have been some pretty substantial changes to the monetary policy process over the last few years, especially in the UK. So let me go through some of these changes and how they might have made it harder to raise rates. So first major change in the monetary policy process is the new tools used by central banks. 
This is one example, QE. QE used to be used on occasion by a few banks. Now this unconventional policy has become almost conventional. This shows the huge increase in asset holdings by the four major central banks. Central banks can now adjust asset holdings, and it can have similar effects as adjusting interest rates. A great example is um, the US in 2013, the taper tantrum period. The US talked about cutting back at some point in the future the amount of assets it's buying. Pretty subtle. And that caused interest rates to go up, spreads to go up, capital flows to emerging markets to fall sharply, and a whole host of effects that were pretty similar to the types of effects you would have gotten if the US had raised rates. So you can see how adjustments to QE and other policy tools can act as a substitute for raising rates and take the burden off adjusting interest rates. So that's one of the new types of tools that may be changing the use of interest rates. Um, Greg Ipp is this great quote where he compares um, <laughs> these new tools as the Star Trek of central banking, taking the Fed into strange new worlds with unknown consequences. Um, I thought that was a great way to capture the fact central banks are using a whole host, host of new tools, not just QE, uh, for guidance, uh, mac a whole host of macro prudential policies. These are policies that many of them have great promise, um, especially macroprudential policies, but they are tools that we haven't widely used. And there are a whole set of interesting issues of how they interact with monetary policy. Do they complement monetary policy? Are they substitutes for monetary policy? If you tighten macroprudential policy, does that mean you don't need to tighten interest rates? And there's some questions about maybe if that it has, if now central banks have this new tool of macroprudential policy, are they using that to tighten financial conditions? And then there's less pressure to raise rates. So that might be feeding into why rates haven't gone up as much. Um, I don't know how much we can generalize that. I think this is very much early days to think about these. But my experience on the MPC suggests there might be something to it. Um, for example, in 2014, when I was just starting on the MPC, this is a period house prices in the UK were increasing rapidly. Consumer borrowing to finance home purchases was accelerating to levels that could indicate future vulnerabilities. And bank exposure to housing-related loans was growing at rates starting to generate concerns. Um, this was also a time we were talking about raising interest rates, potentially. Economy was in decent shape could be time to start tightening. But then the FPC adjusted macroprudential policies to address some of these concerns about credit in the housing sector and bank exposure to housing-related debt. And this did take some of the pressure off monetary policy. You know, I don't want to speak for others on the committee, but at least from my viewpoint, I was worried about some of these financial vulnerabilities. It might have contributed to making me more um, feel more urgency about raising rates. But since I knew the FPC had acted and reduced some of those financial sector vulnerabilities, it left me a bit more time to assess the economic variables of whether it made sense to raise rates or not. So at least on the margin, these types of actions could um, make it easier to delay raising rates or adjusting rates. So those are some of the new tools. In addition to the new tools, there's also been a pretty fundamental change in the roles for central banks over the last few years. And these changes cover a lot of areas. Let me quickly go through some of these changes. One is the mandates. Central banks used to be pretty myopically focused on inflation. Sometimes different mandates, whether it's inflation below a level, around a level, and whether it also had to care about overall activity. But inflation was clearly front and center of their mandates. Since then, some central banks have had their mandates changed, so they also think about and are supposed to care about financial stability. The Norges Bank is a very interesting example where they publish their loss function that goes into monetary policy decisions, and they explicitly take into account the risks of buildups in financial balances. Um, in the Bank of England, in, 20, uh, in 2013, the Bank of England was also given um, a broader, broader expansion of um, tools and mandates where they worry about financial stability, and they have the Financial Policy Committee to address that, and the Prudential Regulatory Authority. And in 2013, the mandate was changed, or the remit was changed, so that the bank was, ex or the Monetary Policy Committee itself was expected to think about the trade offs when returning to inflation to target and the desirable speed by which to return inflation to target. So these are some pretty big changes in what banks should care about and the trade-offs they should consider. There's also been some pretty big changes in the transparency expected of central banks. Um, a huge change from in the past. 
This is Montague Norman, who is uh, governor of the Central B or Bank of England around 1920 to 1944, give or take. This is, I sit under this picture in the MPC meetings for three or four hours, and he glares down at me just to make me realize how serious this is. Um, <laughs> but he, he is a very famous governor, and he strongly believed central banks should stay out of the limelight, out of the press, out of the public eye. Um, his fa favorite or famous quote is, never explain, never apologize. And he felt <laughs> that applied to central banking. He, there was no such thing as a press conference or minutes to let anyone know what went on in those walls. No Treasury Select Committee hearings. Um, he even didn't announce when he changed interest rates. They would just change them and let people figure it out when it costs more to borrow. Um, so pretty big change in transparency when you think about how we do press conferences, we go in front of parliament, we do minutes, we're transcripted, on and on. Um, so transparency has changed. At the same time, as banks play a more public role, they're more transparent, they go out and meet with different segments of the population, they are playing a much bigger public and political role. Um, if you're interested in these sort of changes in the role of central bankers, I recommend a book by Sebastian Malaby. It's a fantastic book. It focuses mostly on the history of central bankers in the US, uh, primarily on Greenspan. Um, it's a big book. You might need the whole summer to get through the book, but it is worth it. Um, it really goes into detail on the evolution of the political role of central bankers that took place largely under Greenspan. Greenspan went from this sort of dorky financial accountant uh, guy worried about the data to one of the main political figures in the United States. Uh, this book is some great stories of how he went up against Kissinger in some battles on internal disputes, and he could out uh, best Kissinger on some political battles. You know, Kissinger, the premier diplomat. Um, but it, the, the book raises, I think, a number of important questions. Central banks play a more public role. There's more outreach, more interaction. This is part of them having more power and greater roles. But this book questions of, can it make it harder, for example, for Greenspan to address some problems? For example, it raises the question that Greenspan might have been more aggressive dealing with some of the housing market problems if he hadn't played such a political role, because he knew that battle was a no winner, uh, and it would not help him win politically. Another interesting contrast talked about in this book is Volcker. Volcker is one of the most famous or infamous central bankers. He came in myopically focused on getting inflation down. So he jacked up interest rates, caused a sharp slowdown, caused a collapse in the housing market. Many people lost their jobs. Um, and he was subject to incredible ire, protests, hate mail, um, constantly lambasted in the press. Um, there were protests against him. There were even all sorts of examples of home builders mailing giant two by four planks to his office because they said, we can't build with these, the market's crashed, you take them. Um, or or um, people selling autos, mailing keys to him because they said no one's buying cars anymore, so he'd get his office full of old keys. Um, or one of my favorites is farmers who were upset. Um, they drove tractors to the Fed and made a blockade around the Fed so no one could come in and out to protest high interest rates by Volcker. I mean, that's a level of political outrage that it's hard to imagine um, in, in today's environment. And even if central bankers were doing things like that today, were willing to do things that created that much ire, I think there's some questions, could they keep their jobs in this much more political environment? Um, it, I've been, it's been quite disconcerting to see in the US and in the UK, there have been public calls and public discussion of whether central bank governors should stay in their positions. And they have not created nearly the sort of ire that you see in Volcker's era. So I think there are some fundamental changes there. Um, but what's all that mean? And this is where I think there are a lot of interesting questions we haven't really thought about. Central banks play a much greater role, much more transparent, um, many more tools, m working with different policies, such as macroprudential policies. I think this, it should yield substantial benefits. It should address some of the problems that did lead to the crisis um, when we weren't paying enough attention to some of these financial sector risks. But at the same time, like any policy, any of these institutional changes probably is going to involve trade-offs and have some costs. And these are the ones I think it's worth thinking about, especially if some of these costs are, it's harder to raise rates. And here's a few ways this could work. Um, if central bankers are playing a much more political role, they're out meeting with the public all the time, engaging with the public, does that make it harder to take away the punch bowl? 
the traditional role of central bankers. Um, much easier to do if you were Montague Norman, you took away the punch bowl, didn't tell anyone about it, and then hid inside your bank and never saw anyone. You know, that does make it a lot easier um, to do those types of policies. Um, there's also the changes in mandate may have made it harder to raise interest rates to address inflation concerns. If you are supposed to care about a broader set of issues, then you might focus, put more weight on those other issues and less on just getting inflation back to a target. Um, one change that I've, I've particularly noticed during my time at the bank is there seems to be more focus on downside risks than in the past. We spend a lot of time talking about what can go wrong, what, what might go wrong, what's the weakness in our forecast. Um, granted, there's been a lot to talk about the last few years, that series of unfortunate events. You know, and as bankers, we need to talk about the risks that should be front and center. But I sometimes worry we focus too much on the downside risks and not enough on the upside. And that that also could lead to an asymmetry in how we respond. Um, and here's, it's hard to prove this, but here's just one thing I put together. I looked at how many times you mentioned risk or downside per 1,000 words in the MPC minutes. And you see this pretty striking pattern. Those numbers have gone up a lot recently. And again, there's been a lot to worry about. There's been a lot of risks in the UK, a lot of potential downside risks. But I find it hard to believe that things are so much worse than, say, in 2008 when the global financial system was freezing up and we were entering the biggest recession since the Great Depression, you know, those were very scary times. Yes, there's a lot of risks now, but it's hard to believe that the number of risks are really that much higher than, say, 2008. So I think there is something where these broader mandates, broader roles of banks are making us focus more on risks. And at the same time, my experience is when we start to worry more about risks, we're much faster to respond to risks by easing monetary policy and much slower to work the other way and raise interest rates when things are looking OK, when the situation is pretty positive. Here, I think there is a real asymmetry in responses. For me, this really hit home uh, last August when there was some worrisome data about the UK economy. There was a risk things could slow after the Brexit surprise vote. So the majority vote, not me, voted for a very aggressive monetary easing in the UK. Wanted to, in case those downside risks materialized, we wanted to have already acted and had support for the economy in place. Then the data started to come in. And the data was much stronger over the next few months than we'd expected. And yet, most people were not willing to reverse course and reduce some of that insurance that was taken out because of downside risks. So this has made me more worried that, again, there is an asymmetry in responses, more willing to quickly respond to downside risks, more hesitant to raise rates in response to positive news. And then the final way in which I think these institutional changes may be affecting the monetary policy process is just time constraints. You know, everyone at the Bank of England works incredibly hard but there's only so many hours in a day. Most people used to focus primarily on monetary policy, at least people on the Monetary Policy Committee. That was where they focused. Now, a number of members on these committees have to sit on other committees. A number of members on the MPC also sit on the Financial Policy Committee and the Prudential Regulatory Authority Committee. Um, and they had do a lot more of transparency and public openness. You know, a lot of this is good. It makes sense to have some people sit on various committees, coordinate the different roles and different responses. But it does sometimes make me worry that people aren't as focused um, on the monetary policy process itself. And here is an example that might be evidence of this. Um, this is what I took from the uh, Bank of England website. It shows votes since uh, independence on the MPC. And what it shows is how many dissenting votes there were each year. And, then a, and a dissent is any time anyone votes against the majority, whether it's QE, interest rates, whatever is up for vote that month. And then I break down the dissents into who dissents. Is it externals, which are people like me, external MPC members who just do MPC? Internals are people who now sit on lots of different committees, um, deputy governors and governors, or deputy governors and the chief economist. And then yellow is the governor. And what you see is there is a pretty robust history of debate um, at the Bank of England. Um, it, it, I, if you actually add it all up, in the first 16 years of the MPC, about 10% of total votes were dissents from the majority. And those dissents came from all sorts of different people. 
about 34% of the dissents were internal members, so people who had more of a management role at the bank and people who now sit on other committees. You even you can see the yellow. The governor was outvoted from time to time, um, and um, that happened a number of occasions. So a lot of robust disagreement. But then you notice about 2014, something seemed to change. Um, you get less, less dissents. You count, I counted from 2014 onwards. There's 3% of all the votes cast are in dissents. Sharp fall from the 10% earlier. Um, a lot of things could have caused that. It might just be that um, the economy is more straightforward. There wasn't much to dissent about. We all agreed. Um, but it could be something else. It's hard to tell. Um, I'm not sure it's just the economics, too, because inflation has overshot and undershot quite a bit and been quite volatile in that period. But what I think is even more notable is the changes in the voting patterns by the type of voter. There has been no dissents by internal members since uh, the start of 2014. And it's unclear why. I mean, there's a lot of things that happened at that time. Um, one thing that happened was that's when the FPC was created. So that's when internal members now had to spend a lot of time doing this new financial policy work, sitting on other committees, spending their time more thinly. Um, this is also the time when there was a change in the mandate of the Bank of England, or the remit of the MPC. And this is when the MPC was told you should also consider trade-offs and the time to return inflation to target. So that might have hit a role. There was also the change. There was a lot of changes in personnel. New governor, all new deputy governors, and new chief economist. So maybe that played a role. Um, and again, there's also, as a statistical person, these are small numbers. So a few changes in people could change this voting pattern a lot. So I don't want to make too much of it. You know, I don't know if this will continue. Um, given the debate we've had the last two days by MPC members, it may not. Um, so my, um, this may be um, irrelevant in a few days or a few weeks. Um, but I think this does suggest that, again, institutional changes at the bank which have yielded a lot of benefits, greater transparency, different tools, people trying to coordinate different tools, may have had some other effects on the institution, on voting patterns. And it may have particularly affected the ability to raise rates. Every one of these dissents in pink, except one, were for higher rates. Um, but we aren't getting as many of those. So put it all together, a lot of changes to the monetary policy process that um, could have raised, made it harder to raise rates. I am short on time, so I'm just going to quickly mention the last one. Um, there have been changes in how monetary policy works. Um, it, because of the zero lower bound, there's some evidence that when you talk about raising rates in countries, that can cause the exchange rate to appreciate a lot, slow down inflation, and then make it harder to raise rates. And this sensitivity has seemed to increase over time. Um, so that has potentially also made it harder to raise rates. But I'll just talk about quickly the last potential explanation for why rates have not gone up is a persistence in inflation dynamics related to the exchange rate. And this is the more technical work. I'm just going to again go over it quickly because it's late in the evening. Um, but here's a summary of some research I've been doing with two colleagues at the Bank of England. So standard models of inflation focus on the amount of slack in the economy, such as the unemployment rate, how much spare capacity there is, and inflation expectations, what people expect to happen to prices as predictions of uh, what will happen to inflation. So there's the key variables. They go into your DSGE models. They often include Phillips curve relationships. That's believed to be the core of what's next for inflation and the core of how central bankers think about inflation. But in this work I've been doing with some colleagues at the Bank of England, we say, you know, this is all useful. But this hasn't worked terribly well recently, especially Phillips curve relationships between unemployment and wages um, and inflation. So we suggest we might also want to look at things a different way. Look at the time series dynamics of inflation. And we can use this technical procedure to split inflation into two components, a per more persistent, slow-moving part of inflation, a part that once it moves, doesn't move very much, and monetary policymakers should focus on. And then there's temporary short-term cyclical movements around this longer term, slower moving trend in inflation. And we use some statistics. This is an approach which has been used in the US with some success to explain what's going on with inflation, but hasn't been applied well to the UK. So we take this framework and we break down UK inflation into the short term cyclical movements, which is in red, headline inflation on the left, core on the right, and then the slow moving trend of inflation.
And it's the slow moving trend, the blue, which is what we should really focus on for monetary policy. These are shifts in inflation that will likely persist unless you make some changes. Um, and you can see that's moved around quite a bit in the UK. There's been quite a lot of volatility in this slow moving, more persistent part of inflation. And I graphed that, that slow moving component here with 90% air, uh, air bands or 80% air bands just to show um, how it has moved recently. In, uh, headline inflation, this slow moving persistent component has spiked quite quickly from 0.5% a couple years ago to 2.4% today. So that suggests there has been a real shift in this sort of permanent component of inflation dynamics. So what's that mean for raising rates? I think that has some implications for why rates haven't gone up yet in the UK. Um, when you break down what drives these movements in inflation, the cyclical part and the trend, what you find is global variables matter a lot. Um, cyclical, the short-term movements in inflation in the UK, the red, is largely driven by commodity prices, world export prices. So that's OK to look through, not respond to. But movements in the exchange rate affect the more slow-moving part of inflation. Slack in inflation expectations don't seem to play much of a role. So what that means for 20, the last couple of years, lower commodity prices, lowered headline inflation, but that's OK to look through, which is what the MPC strategy has been. But the fact sterling appreciated about 15% 2014, 2015, that lowered the slow moving blue trend component of inflation. And that's why it was hard to lift off and raise rates. Inflation was being held down by this powerful effect of sterling. So I think that does, it's another factor feeding into not raising rates. So put it all together. Three reasons why rates have not, um, three sets of reasons, which has made it hard to raise rates until recently. I think all have some merit. There has been economic reasons holding back growth, have been changes to the monetary policy process, making it hard to raise rates. And there has been these persistent effects of sterling's appreciation, holding down inflation, making it hard to raise rates. What's that mean for today? Um, and that is the final point, question I want to touch on. Three explanations explain why rates didn't go up until recently. Do they still apply? So let's take them one at a time again. Economic arguments, is the economy fragile? Here, I think there is still some fragility, but not nearly enough to justify the very substantial amount of stimulus in place in the economy. Um, the headwinds from the crisis have faded. Our start is lower. We're not getting as much stimulus from Lourdes, but we're still getting a lot of stimulus. In the unfortunate events, who knows what's going to happen? There's certainly uncertainty about the political process, Brexit negotiations. Um, but the series of sharp unfortunate events holding back growth seem to, at least for now, faded. We'll see. Um, but the bottom line is, I think the economy is strong, much stronger. There's less merit to fundamental economic weakness holding back any rate increase. Um, and here's just for those of you who are data junkies, some of the data. GDP growth, 0.5%, above, expected to remain above trend. Unemployment, 4.6%, 40-year 40 uh, 40 low, little slack in the economy. Inflation, 2.9%, expected to probably go above 3%, going to overshoot for over three years. Core inflation, also up, broad pickup in prices. Even if you take out exchange rate effects or minimize exchange rate effects, focus on domestic cost pressures, those are also going up. I like to focus on an inverse variance weighted measure of domestically generated inflation to try to downplay stuff that bounces around month to month, focus on various measures of domestic inflation taking out exchange rate effects. Those have been going up for about 18 months. Over half of them are now at levels consistent with inflation at 2%. It's now above the 2% threshold when you look at the composite. Domestic costs are going up. The one Carter argument you hear from um, some people why you shouldn't raise rates based on economic weakness is wage growth. Wage growth has been soft. There's no doubt about that. But in my view, we need to look more broadly than wage growth when thinking about domestic costs. We need to look at other, domestic, other costs. We also shouldn't just look at wage growth. You need to look at total labor costs and ideally unit labor costs adjusting for productivity growth. And productivity growth has been very low. So we can't have wage growth get to pa back to past averages. It would lead to a sharper pickup in inflation. We need to adjust wages for productivity growth. And these unit labor costs are firmer than the wage growth data and closer to levels that would be consistent with 2% inflation. And finally, a lesson from history. If we wait till wage growth has accelerated to where we're, uh, inflation's around 2%, we've probably waited too long. That's why we spent a lot of time estimating slack and spare capacity and all that.
So lots of different ways to interpret the data. You've gotten a taste uh, this week of the different views out there on the MPC and different ways of cutting that. But at least in my view, there is still s some reasons to keep some stimulus in place in the economy, but not enough to justify the huge amount of stimulus still out there. So first argument, less merit today. Second argument, changes in the monetary policy process. I think there have been fundamental changes in the process, changes in the institutions, institutional structure, changes in the tools, changes in the roles, um, more sensitivity to the exchange rate, that's going to continue to play a role. And I think these factors will continue to make it a bit harder to raise interest rates. But the final factor is the one where I think there has been a fundamental reversal, which for me makes it more urgent to raise interest rates sooner rather than later. In the past, sterling's appreciation in 2014 and 2015 acted as a persistent drag on inflation and help justify not raising interest rates. It's holding down this very longer term component of inflation. And that has now reversed. Um, now it is working in the opposite direction. We've hit a roughly 20% depreciation in sterling since a period right before the Brexit vote. This is pushing up on inflation. Headline trend inflation is already at 2.4%. Normally, that would immediately require tighter monetary policy. You might argue you wouldn't need to do that if you hit a lot of slack in the economy or if inflation expectations were very low, but that's not the case today. Um, if anything, there's minimal snack, and inflation expectations have been going up a bit, although they're still around what's consistent with 2% inflation. So it's hard to explain why, given this persistent effect of the exchange rate on inflation, we don't start to respond soon. And the other thing that's raised my concern is that um, when you get this trend component of inflation above 2% or below for an extended period, the length of time and the amount by which it overshoots or undershoots will make it harder to get inflation back to 2% over time. Um, and that suggests there's reasons to act sooner rather than later. There are costs to waiting. You know, caveats, this is all a simplistic framework. This doesn't consider all the other factors we think about on the MPC, such as concerns related to Brexit uncertainty. But I think it does make a powerful case that we should start launching off interest rates soon. Um, because of these concerns, though, that does suggest that we should adjust interest rates to a limited and gradual amount. We should be nimble. Um, I would like to see monetary policy be faster to make adjustments to interest rates in either direction, whether up or down, as needed. I think we should be less hesitant to adjust when the data changes and the situation changes, just as engineers are quick to adjust a launch date. If there's a technical concern or a change in the weather, um, I hope we will get to do the same or start to do more of the same on the MPC. Yeah, otherwise, the UK economy may face some greater challenges than launching. And I will stop there and be happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. That was really a terrific talk. And I, I think once more you have shown that you can uh, really bring a lot of uh, rigor and, uh, if I may say so, academic clarity to uh, extremely uh, complex issues that central bankers are now facing. So we have a lot of things to think about. So you told us about how difficult it is to raise interest rates these days. You also told us that there are very important changes in the monetary policy uh, transmission channels, and in particular that we should think a lot more about exchange rates. Mm -hmm. And you told us that there are important changes in the process of monetary policy as well. So no doubt there's going to be a lot of um, questions from the, from the room here, but I'm going to use my privilege <laughs> as a chair, and I'm going to ask you the first one. And uh, so let me ask you a little bit more about exchange rates, because it's the last thing that you, you talked about. <laughs> so uh, let's imagine that at some point the Bank of England raised the interest rate, and you would expect presumably an appreciation of a sterling. Mm -hmm. And as you told us, that would probably also have a sizable impact on uh, inflation downward, which is what you would, you would hope. But then what about the real economy? So how would you assess the effect on, on net exports and the potentially contractionary effect? So can, we, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is an issue we spend a lot of time debating, as one might expect. Yeah, how would any adjustments affect the exchange rate? Um, and it's even small movements in the exchange rate have pretty substantial effects on expected inflation and the forecast overall. So these effects are important. Um, 
The challenge we've faced recently, though, is traditionally the channels you mentioned are how, how things work. Even if we just talk about raising interest rates, that leads to a tightening the yield curve, exchange rate appreciates, and then it might even be hard to raise rates, but you still get the real effects on the economy, the effects on exports um, in the real economy. But what struck us recently is that there has been a disconnect between the exchange rate is moving quite a bit, and it does not seem to be as correlated with interest rates or monetary policy as in the past. The exchange rate instead, no surprise, seems to be much more sensitive to political news and news on what is happening, especially with related to Brexit announcements. So that's not to say monetary policy doesn't matter. I'm sure it will. If there is a change in monetary policy, we will probably see some effects. But those effects do seem to be recently at least dwarfed by other factors which seem to move the exchange rate. So I think that that is tricky to, to think about in isolation. But then the real economy effects, there's another set of interesting issues of generally we expect an exchange rate depreciation would boost growth in exports quite a bit. We're expecting to get some of that effect because of the 20% depreciation we've just had. Um, but it's unclear if the normal effects are going to pan out because there is a lot of uncertainty by exporters about their access to markets what's going to happen to their future trading arrangements. So that's one thing we're, we're watching very closely. We think there's going to be some effect, but we're hesitant to think there's going to be the same usual large effect you get from a depreciation because some exporters might be hesitant to invest to take advantage of cheaper export prices because they don't know if they're going to have access to that market in the future. Um. Thank you very much. So I think now we should open to the floor. So we are going to take uh, two or three questions at the time. So I would ask you to identify yourself and uh, then to have a short question and please no statements. <laughs> <laughs> so we start from the, from the back, the lady there. I... Thank you. Professor Dr. Forbes, first of all, thanks, I think, from all of us for importing your international expertise <laughs> for the benefit of UK public service. Um, I have two short questions, if I may. OK, one short. and a half. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one is, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a, a fair deal of um, anxiety in the markets about the longevity of this consumer-led recovery, given the unfortunate confluence of low savings, high consumer debt levels, and weak real uh, wages growth. Um, have you done any work about the neutral policy rate level in the UK? As in, do you see, uh, have you got a, a figure in mind as to where rates might go <laughs> before, before we start thinking about monetary policy contributing to tail risks of a sharp consumer-led slowdown? Um, the second question, if I may, um, you make a fantastic point about the role of nominal variables in policy setting with respect to the fact that in the glo post-globalization world, price setting seems to be, uh, or inflation setting, seems to be a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. There's so much about the exchange rate and the international oil price, which has got little to do with just UK conditions, demand supply that feeds into it. Do you feel that in the post-globalization world, perhaps we really need to think differently about wages. In other words, capital mobility has reduced pricing power of labor. And therefore, we shouldn't be looking for wages to pick up to distinguish between lasting or transitory effects, second round effects from oil prices or exchange rates or any imported inflation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, there was also uh, the gentleman up there. If you can give a mic, yeah. Thank you. So, um, Please identify yourself. Sorry, my name is Bill Raj. I'm from Barclays. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. On the last slide, you mentioned central banks um, could be more nimble. Um, maybe one of the reasons that you kind of alluded to in your talk that, that we haven't seen any hikes is because there wasn't a clear path to a cycle of interest rate hikes, and people were maybe uh, conscious or concerned about doing one hike and done. Um, so I'd, I'd welcome your comments on that um, and how that might play out in the future um, and how central banks um, and the MBC may change their behavior. Um, secondly, and, and sort of related to that, it seems that central banks can be more nimble by just talking up the market and talking down the market and clearly talking um, up interest rates. Uh, market interest rates will have an effect on, on investment and on the, on the real economy. To what extent are they currently doing that and can they continue to do that um, to, to not have to be more nimble in their actions, but just in their words. Thank you. And then we take the, the last question. So here, please, on the front. Hi, my name is Yeria Lowe. I'm with Church Commissioners. Um, I was just wondering about the taking away the punch bowl factor, or take, uh, removing that. 
Uh, so we've seen a lot of asset inflation, I would say, but not as much on the kind of common man benefit. Um, so now that you raise rates, or if we go into a, a raised yet. rate environment, <laughs> How, you're, do you consider whether you're leaving a section of society behind, as we've already kind of seen, kind of voiced in the rise of populism? Thank you. So I think if uh, so we can quickly. start with us, we <laughs> okay. and then we'll take a second round. Okay. Um, I, these are all great questions I could spend a long time answering, but I will, knowing there's others out there, I'll try to be brief. So first, um, in terms of the international experience, thank you, all, those of you from the UK, for welcoming someone who is not a British citizen for this important role. It's been a fantastic experience. Um, in terms of the longevity of the consumer um, consumers spending, this is something we've spent a lot of time worrying about. What is happening to consumers? That's a key part of our forecast. We have been expecting consumer spending to slow down, and, have, and that's where um, a lot of people are watching. If it slows down more than expected or if it holds up better than expected is going to be key for some people on where they see monetary policy going. And again, I think we're expecting some slowdown. We're expecting consumers to draw on their savings some because there is a short-term decrease in spending power because inflation is higher than wage growth. Um, but if this is a temporary effect, then some drawdown on savings is a natural smoothing of income. Um, key is going to be the, what happens with wage growth, if wage growth will start to pick up some and if inflation does start to come down. The one lesson I have learned from the US, though, is I am continually surprised at how low savings can go before things break. Um, and I think, in, especially in the UK, the savings data is not terribly reliable and tends to be revised heavily. And it recently revised up, which has suggested there's actually a bit more room for the consumers to draw down before you really start to get to worrisome levels. Um, role of global variables, incredibly important. And that's something that has really hit home for me. We all know the UK is the traditional small open economy affected by the rest of the world. But especially in this research I've done recently where I try to explain um, different components of inflation. The fact I ran, I only went over this quickly, but I ran tons of different tests trying to find a role for all sorts of domestic variables. And you could get some significant, but the magnitude of the effects, the changes in the domestic UK economy and inflation are much smaller smaller than these global effects, whether it's commodity prices or oil prices that are short term or exchange rate changes, which are granted partly domestic, partly international. Um, but that, for me, is also a lesson for um, monetary policy and people watching monetary policy. Um, we can't keep inflation very steady around 2% in the UK, even if growth is stable and we're at full capacity and everyone's doing everything they should be doing. There's going to be a lot of volatility simply because of the role of international influences on inflation. Um, so in terms of central banks being no, more nimble, um, I, I, maybe we should, oh, oh, have we not been more nimble because we're concerned that one hike might not be able to be followed by a series of rate hikes? So that is something that I haven't, I haven't um, worried about. I think we focus on the decision at that time, at that point in time. You know, we do think about where we'd like to th see things settle. But one lesson I've learned is it's so hard to predict what's going to happen, <laughs> especially that series of unfortunate events. You know, I, I really set monetary policy each month based on what I know about that month. Um, I think the bigger concern for some people is the cost of reversals. It's not so much what you see the full cycle being, but you don't want to adjust rates and then a month or two later adjust them in the opposite direction. I think there are more concerns by some people about that. I think I put less weight on that again as I think we should set monetary policy each month based on what makes sense that month, but that's my view. Um, and I think that would help us be more nimble. Could we be more nimble just by talking markets up and down? Um, I would worry about that because I would think we'd lose credibility pretty quickly. Um, and the other danger of that is, is one lesson I have learned is although sometimes we try to send a message that all, the language is not always interpreted exactly the way we would like it to be interpreted. So I would, I would again, just my personal view, worry about trying to talk markets up and down based on specific language. I think it's better to just try to express what we're doing, be transparent about our thought process, what variables matter, and then let people decide what that means. Um, taking away the punch bowl, do we think about distributional issues? Um, that's, that's a question we, we do spend time thinking about. Um, but we come at it slightly differences, different, w differently than I think the question was posed. 
Um, we, the central bank right now has enough uh, mandates, enough targets, enough remits. I think we should focus on what those remits are. And distributional issues is not in our remit. I feel very strongly that that should be the role of government, of elected officials, to think about distributional issues. Um, as I said already, our role has been expanded with uh, inflation and financial stability. We don't need to add more <laughs> to complicate things. Um, but having said that, we do spend a lot of time looking at distribution, um, distribution of debt and thinking about how changes in the economy could affect different groups of people based on their debt, based on their income levels, and how differential responses of different segments of the economy could be affected by things such as changes in interest rates. So we think about that, but we only think about it in the sense of how will that affect our forecast for growth, um, for inflation, and the macro variables that we care about. Thank you very much. We're going to take the last two questions, and I have here. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. That was very illuminating. Um, my name is Guy. Um, in the first third of your presentation, you used language such as the forecasts were not, they were not as expected, they were not as we expected, they were not as I expected, they were not as uh, were expected. Does that mean that you're looking in the wrong places, that the indicators ought to be reselected so that perhaps more accuracy can be developed? Perhaps people are looking in the wrong direction. Um, so, uh, here, a gentleman there. Um, what, I have a specific question about the excess Federal res uh, Reserve levels, basically things that have been unlended. I looked at that number in December, so it was like $3 trillion, which seems like a very high number. And I wonder how that impacts on whether changes in interest rates or quantitative easing can be effective if there's so much money that's not already lended out. You forgot to identify yourself, oh, please. My name is Jim. I'm an LBS alumni. Thank you very much. And there's an insistent uh, <laughs> third question here, so, but we, we, we will have to stop after that. <laughs> Hi, uh, Philip Dragumis, uh, St. James Place Wealth Management. Just, I would like to allude to the elephant in the room, which nobody's really talking about, the B word, Brexit. Um, it, you know, there, it is a rather potentially very unfortunate event that will happen over the next two, three years. I'm just wondering if you have made any scenario analysis, potential uh, uh, you know, impact on GDP, um, how that will affect everything going forward, because obviously everything's up in the air, and I would like to hear how you view this going forward and if you've made any models about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. So three very different interests or er, questions. Uh, forecasts. Uh, so I think there is a very nice speech I recommend you look at that Jan Bliai, one of my colleagues at the MPC, gave a couple of months ago on forecasts and just what to expect of forecasts and talking about how we don't always get it right. Um, but we do have to still, given all the uncertainty, all the information we don't have, try to do our best case. And then you need to look at the air bands, look at the range around it. Um, so a bit of a defense of the forecasting process. He makes it quite eloquently. So I'll leave that to him. But do we need to look at other issues, other variables? I think we, there is certainly value in trying to look at models other than our formal DSGE models and what those pop out. And that's actually exactly what I tried to do in this stuff I went over very quickly at the end. I probably didn't do it enough justice, was take a totally different approach to trying to explain inflation dynamics. That's an area where we haven't been particularly successful forecasting. Um, and try to, again, come at it totally differently. And I got some very different results about the role of the exchange rate, which I think could actually explain some of our misses in the forecast. So I think that's an example of it is useful to come at it in different ways. The framework I propose certainly isn't going to get at all the issues that the DSG models get at. But I am a fan of different models for different purposes. Look at them all together to try to get an overall picture. Um, also, you mentioned this sort of we versus I versus us on the forecast. I think it is worth thinking, too, about how the forecast process goes. The staff present a forecast. We on the MPZ will then argue on specific aspects of it, what we agree with, disagree with. Um, and we all sort of come together with what we call the um, best consensus forecast. Usually, most of us disagree with parts of that forecast, but we all can't do our own forecasts. So we each sort of sign off on the general trend, and then we publicly talk about where we have different views or different perspectives. 
Um, so I think none of us will exactly agree to, or usually aren't going to pin everything on exactly where that forecast might be. But it is a useful place to structure arguments of why you don't agree with, say, a policy decision implied by the forecast. It does force you to, force you to say, I have a different um, belief in the equilibrium unemployment rate, for example. So that's where I differ from the forecast and why I think inflation will be different and why I come out with a different policy response. So when we talk about our forecast, R is very loose. It's sort of the framework that we then use to have our other discussions around, which I think is useful. Um, the Fed. Um, I'd rather not get into commenting on the Fed. That's one thing I've learned in, um, in this business of central banking. But I, I will just say that uh, what the Fed does is obviously very important for global interest rates in the global environment, and that has big implications for the UK. Some of the challenges in 2014, when it looked like the UK might be the first country to launch and raise interest rates ahead of the US, I think that is part of the reason why we got such a strong exchange rate effect which then dampened inflation and made it harder to raise rates because we were the first one out there getting rates off around close to zero. Now that the Fed has started this process and other banks are starting to cut back on some of their stimulus, that would reduce some of these feedback effects if the UK does start to go down the tightening path. Um, and the factors you were talking in could feed into that. Um, finally, Brexit. <laughs> um, yes, the elephant in the room. Um, we have talked about it so much. Maybe that's why I didn't want to talk about it too much more tonight. Um, we all know it's out there. It's obvious on everyone's mind. Um, this is why this is one of the big uncertainties about the forecast. But what we've also learned is after the Brexit vote, when there was a big increase in some measures of uncertainty around the vote, we expected this to significantly impact business spending, investment, consumer spending, and have widespread effects on the economy. And it didn't. Um, there were not big effects of heightened uncertainty after the Brexit vote on the economy. If anything, growth strengthened for a bit. Since then, we've seen some effects on investment. Investment is maybe a bit lower, but it's hard to know what it would have been. But we haven't seen the big pullback because of heightened uncertainty. We're seeing more effects because higher inflation is affecting real incomes and consumer spending. But again, we're not seeing these huge effects of heightened uncertainty. So I think that has raised a caution. And I actually I gave a speech on this last November on how we think about uncertainty. Um, and what I came, the conclusion I came to is we need to think about what type of uncertainty matters. I think the fact the newspapers are talking about Brexit and uncertainty in these negotiations a couple years down the road doesn't affect a lot of companies that focus on the domestic market. Um, it doesn't affect consumers that are feeling very confident in their jobs. They see unemployment at record lows. Um, they go out and spend the same way they would. Um, also, if financial market conditions are quite easy, and right now financial market conditions have been quite easy, that also um, might make uncertainty have less effect. Often uncertainty spikes, financial markets dry up, and that's when you get big effects of uncertainty because it's hard to get loans. Um, and those effects haven't happened. So I think, again, that has to make us cautious. Yes, there's uncertainty out there. It might start to affect consumers and businesses quite a bit more going forward, but there's also a chance it doesn't, as we, or only as a smaller effect as we've seen so far, especially if we continue to see people confident about their jobs, unemployment low, credit conditions pretty easy. Um, so again, we've got to watch it, but I don't think that's a reason to be incredibly, um, to keep a huge amount of stimulus in place because of what might happen at some point in these negotiations that might take a long period of time. Um, and then your specific question, have we modeled it? Yes. <laughs> um, we did some models before the vote of what might happen. Um, after the vote, when we knew the outcome, we did another extensive set of refining models of how this could affect the economy. I mean, it's incredibly hard because we don't know what's going to be negotiated. And uh, I mean, you can get a huge range of outcomes based on what happens to trade, migration, um, if there's compensating trade agreements with other countries to partially make up for reduced trade. You know, all, so many scenarios. It's very hard to do at this point. We have um, an approach which I found very useful as we've started to go sector by sector and look at specific industries and what are the industries that matter, or what are the issues that will matter in that industry, how big is that industry for the broader economy, and then it'll help us being able to sort of track as we learn more about these negotiations, what sectors it might hurt, and then how that sector could have spillover effects. So there's a lot of work going on. Um, but it's all incredibly imprecise. Um, so I think, you know, as, th as we learn more, we'll be able to say more concretely. But it's certainly being done. That sounds very sensible, very imprecise. <laughs> 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 this is always the case in macroeconomics. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, so Christine, I think, uh, thank you again ex very, very much for your great presentation, also for your willingness and great openness in answering the questions also so precisely. Mm -hmm. So I think we are all very much wiser now after this talk, <laughs> and I'm sure the Bank of England will miss you very dearly. Personally, I have to say I will miss you enormously on this side of the Atlantic, so hopefully we'll cross it once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so I think we owe Christine a whole uh, range of applause here and we'll have drinks. <laughs>